Hi, my name is Adora Svitok, and I'm back with my favorite things. Yep, books. Okay, that was just my favorite things. You might have seen a giant plate full of food, too. But books are pretty amazing. I haven't quite decided which I like better, food or books. I think both are pretty essential. Now, my topic right now is really how the cultural experience is depicted in poetry, because there's a lot of powerful ways that we see narratives happening and um, often being conveyed in very few words. But I'm also going to discuss the story, the Yellow Wallpaper. It's arguable if it's so much the cultural experience, but I think it provides a really good perspective of the life of a very repressed Victorian woman, and um, so a valuable addition to the whole discussion around culture. Now, the first poem is Dream Variations by Langston Hughes. So you've probably heard Langston Hughes' poetry before. He's extremely popular, one of the best-known poets of the Harlem Renaissance. And his poems really touch very poignantly on these cultural themes, often using this very... Um, evocative rhythm that was kind of reminiscent of the beat of music at the time of jazz and so he has all these great poems which really use simple language and strike at the reader's heart. So you might have heard Theme for English B or the um, Cross, Song for a Dark Girl, Harlem Sweeties, there are all these different very famous poems. One of my favorites is also Harlem, starts with What Happens to a Dream Deferred. So, I'm going to read from Dream Variations. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till a white day is done, then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree, while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done, rest at pale evening, a slim, tall tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. Now, this poem, I think, speaks to a lot of, I guess, cultural thinking as well, about black and white. Oftentimes, people will talk about the night, the darkness, as something to be scared of, apprehension. There's all these negative feelings associated with it. So for this poem to really shift that narrative and speak of the night and the day with equal pleasure, dancing in the face of the sun, but also waiting for the tender night that is black like him, that's a really powerful statement with that poem. But you also see how there's an exquisite simplicity to the way that poem is written. It's not using all this, like, high flute and language, as in the beautiful night strikes deeply in the approaching dawn of the vicious morning. I don't even know what that is. Okay, that's not high flute. But the point is that it's concise and it gets the point across in a beautiful way. Now, there's also this amazing poem, Harlem, and it provides a visual of what happens to a dream deferred. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Run, explode, there's all these different alternatives. And that last line is extremely haunting because it implies that dreams deferred are not something to be ignored, that they can be dangerous. Now another poem to go to a very different segment. This one is High Holy Days by Jane Shore. I highly recommend reading it. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing because if I did, this video would be extremely long considering that it goes across three pages. But I think that the important thing is that it creates this very powerful visual. It's telling this narrative in a personal way about being at the synagogue and really living through her history in this simple moment. And so she gets all these different moments, as in, here's an example. Each time we stood up, my head hurt from the heat, dizzy from tripping over the alphabets, black spikes and lyres, stick figure battalions marching to defend the second temple of Jerusalem. So the things that she sees in front of her that appear simple at first, a Torah, an alphabet, take on life and meaning in the context of Jewish history. Rocking on their heels, boats anchored in the harbor of devotion, the temple elders of En Kaddish mourning the dead. Our neighbor who owned the laundry down the street covered his left wrist out of habit, numbers indelible as those he inked on my father's shirt collars. So there again we see an allusion to Jewish history, numbers on someone's wrist from the Holocaust. In another part, she says that uh, she's seeing a red rain falling on their ranks of regiments of, arm of armies. I watched it fall one drop at a time. I felt faint, 
and breathed out sharply my nose spattering blood across the page. So we see the historical really crossing over to the personal in an extremely visceral way. She's feeling this, she's seeing it, it's coming alive. And as a reader, as a reader who's not having an insider's perspective, this is a really um, visceral way to experience it as well, which is why I find this poem so insightful. But then it's the last line that I think really does it. So she's had this experience, and then she's exiting the synagogue. And I reeled home through the day's traffic of the business day, past shoppers, past my school, in session as usual, spat like Jonah from the whale back into the Jew-hating world. That last line just strikes right there, because you've, you've heard this poem, you've heard the insight, you've heard the references, the allusions, the history experienced as personal, and suddenly it's just like a punch in the gut, right? Going from that out into the Jew-hating world, as she says. So, High Holy Days by Jane Shore, Dream Variations by Langston Hughes, really powerful insights, two different cultures. Final example of an awesome short story, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This is a warning as to what happens when you lock up women and don't let them do anything productive, which was actually a legit thing that was proposed by a really stupid doctor whose name I forget. And he um, basically pioneered this movement to treat women's hysteria, hysteria, where he would say, okay, it's because they've been overworked and women are so weak because they just, you know, that's women, they're weak, right? So in order to give them back their energy, keep them in the same room, don't let them do anything productive, don't let them do any vigorous exercise, only let them see children, don't let them basically write, read, anything that will tax their weak minds and bodies. So what happens is you get women being locked up and do you think that makes their hysteria go away? No, in many cases it would actually make people go insane from all the restriction. And I like this story because it's an extremely disturbing story, but it's disturbing in the right ways. It's very insidious. It creeps under your skin like it needs to and like the main character is feeling. As an example, the title, The Yellow Wallpaper, comes from this lady. She's in a room and she's staring at the yellow wallpaper because that's all she can do. Her husband doesn't want her to write too taxing. So here's what happens in the middle of the story. I really have discovered something at last. Through watching so much at night, when it changes so, I have finally found out. The front pattern does move and no wonder the woman behind shakes it. Sometimes I think there are a great many women behind, and sometimes only one, and she crawls around fast and her crawling shakes it all over. Then in the very bright spot she keeps still, and in the very shady spot she just takes hold of the bars and shakes them hard. And she is all the time trying to climb through, but nobody could climb through that pattern. It strangles so. I think that is why it has so many heads. They get through, and then the pattern strangles them and turns them upside down and makes their eyes white. If those heads were covered or taken off, it would not be half so bad. Now remember, she's talking about a wallpaper. When have you seen that looking at a wallpaper? That's what I mean about the insidiousness of it. It's describing this from her point of view. So reading this in the first person, you have the uncomfortable sense that you, along with her, are journeying into the descent into insanity. The final moment of the story, which I highly recommend that you read, it's arguable whether it's a victory or a defeat, whether by succumbing to her insanity, but also rebelling against the conformity or the locks in prison, uh, imposed upon her that are her imprisoned, whether she is succeeding or not. So it's a very interesting, insightful story that provides a lot of wisdom about the human mind. In short, great poems, great story. Next time you're reading any kind of literature, look at what it tells you about the cultural experience. Does the race, ethnicity, religion of the main characters tell you anything about how the story is written, how the poem is written, and the insights it might provide? Because we can truly find amazing things about human nature and the human experience whenever we pick up a book. Thank you.